Welcome to today's GNCC Espresso Life, all about equity, diversity, and inclusion in practice. The moral and business cases for board and staff diversity are clear. A significant amount of research has been done to demonstrate that diverse boards, committees, and organizations function better and ultimately make better decisions. Responsible organizations are looking at themselves today and are asking whether they are appropriately diverse. Even where there's a strong support for broadening diversity, we often hear that little thought is given to what might actually change beyond the optics. And change can be slow to manifest itself. At a pace of one or two new board or staff members each year, it can take years for the demographic makeup of an organization to shift. And the chances are that boards and organizations will continue with its business as before. In other words, how do we ensure a strong commitment to inclusion will lead to the change we hope for? And that is what today's webinar is all about. My name is Mishka Balsam, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. Internally at the GNCC, we recently approved a diversity and inclusion policy. We are committed to inclusion, accessibility, and equity. Please, to all of our attendees today, reach out with any thoughts or requests that you might have of us to make your experience with the GNCC as inclusive as possible. And to make a webinar such as this one possible, we are fortunate to have community partners by our side, equally committed to diversity and inclusion. We are joined by the Vice President of Student Success at Niagara College, Rick Anderson. Rick's appointment marks an important milestone for Niagara College as he is the college's first Indigenous Vice President. He is an experienced senior leader in the Ontario College system, has an extensive experience working with, indigenous, with the Indigenous community, and Rick has contributed to several provincial committees. He holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Philosophy and Psychology and a Master of Social Work Policy Analysis from McMaster's University. He is currently completing his PhD at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. And here is a message from Rick Anderson. Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Anderson, Vice President of Student Success at Niagara College. I hope everyone is well and staying safe. The college is very pleased to be a sponsor for this webinar on diversity and inclusion in the workplace. At Niagara College, we fully support inclusion, equity, and diversity on all levels. And we stand firmly with those fighting racism, inequity, and injustice. I'd like to briefly share some of the work happening at the college. We have a diversity and inclusion task force, and this task force has been developing a framework and blueprint for a more inclusive, diverse, and culturally and globally engaged college community. Currently, the task force is collecting information on existing best practices within the NC community, and they are meeting with other post-secondary institutions to discuss key learnings from diversity and inclusion initiatives others have rolled out. A couple of points I want to highlight about the task force and the process they're following. First, this is a partnership with our students, and the task force is a joint initiative between the college and our student administrative council. And secondly, further to that, when I've talked to members of the task force, one of the most impactful aspects of the task force's work is the creation of safe spaces where people can have open and honest conversations to ask questions they have and share their experiences promoting and creating an environment of a learning organization on the EDI front is so critical to this work. The other point I wanted to add is a personal comment. Being an Indigenous person who grew up on an Indian reserve, I personally have direct experience with systemic societal structures that can create barriers and marginalize people. And so I want to commend and congratulate the GNCC on the work they're doing on the EDI front and just say how happy I am to see this webinar being offered. I unfortunately have a scheduling conflict today and I'm not able to join the event live, but I'm hoping I'll be able to review a recording of the presentations. So once again, thanks to GNCC for offering this great event. The college is so pleased to be a sponsor. And thank you to today's speakers for offering their experience and knowledge. Have a great event, everyone. Thank you very much uh, to Niagara College and to Rick, especially actually for being here by our side. Um, 
and uh, making a webinar like uh, today possible. And it's also my personal privilege to actually introduce uh, our two experts on this topic. We have with us this morning, Rashmi Biswas, who has successfully led large teams, held profit and loss accountability and gained extensive business experience with corporate and academic arenas in Canada, the United States and the UK. Rashmi is the co-owner of Lakin Associates, where she specializes in leadership development, team performance, and process facilitation, working with public sector and private sector clients, and has provided services in North and South America, Asia, and in the Middle East. Rashmi holds a Master's of in Human Resource Management, a Bachelor of Science, and a Postgraduate Certificate in Adult Education, Facilitation, and Training. And she holds a diversity and inclusion for HR certificate from Cornell University. Rashmi is an instructor with the Goodman School of Business, Brock University, and a program facilitator with the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. In a volunteer capacity, Rashmi currently serves on the board of the Niagara Community Foundation, is a member of the St. Catherine's Anti-Racism Advisory Committee, and is a co-founder of the Gender Equity Task Force Niagara. Rashmi, it's so wonderful to have you with us. And we're also being joined by Michelle Groholsky, the founder and owner of Empowered, a boutique consulting firm on a mission to make equity, diversity, and inclusion EDI, an integral part of how organizations and their people operate. Empowered was born out of Michelle's 15 years of experience designing and leading global EDI strategies across industries, including financial services, high tech, and land property and construction. Driven by the slow rate of global progress and a tendency for companies to focus on surface level initiatives that fail to elicit behavioral or cultural change, Michelle designed Empowered with the intention of making change where it matters most in our decision making, people systems and practices. She draws extensively on her graduate training in organizational psychology and experience as an International Federation Associate Certified Coach to address both the systems and mindsets crucial in meaningful progress. Her work has been recognized in Canada, the United Kingdom, and the US in the areas of inclusion and diversity, women's advancement, employee engagement, and empowerment. Michelle, and to both of you, thank you for being with us today. I can't wait to get actually into the dialogue. And for our attendees, I just want to make you aware that if you wish to enable live transcript, please refer to the bottom of the Zoom screen and you will see a button that actually indicates it. And if you have a question uh, and would like to ask it, please feel free to utilize the chat or raise the hand function. And um, your questions are visible to the panel and uh, the panelists, and we will do our best to get to all of them. We've had a high number of questions and comments that have come to us via social media or email. And again, we are more than committed to getting to all of them. And on that note, um, I think let's start the dialogue. And here is one of the questions uh, that I think maybe starts out, uh, is a good base to start out with. The language of equity, diversity, inclusion has certainly entered into everyday conversations over the last year or so. Could you define these terms for our audience, Michelle and Rashmi, and perhaps explain why we talk about all three of them? And maybe on that note, if I can ask Michelle, do you want to go first? And um, then I'll pass it over to Rashmi as well. Michelle? I'd be delighted. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I think of equity, diversity, and inclusion as three related but distinct concepts. When we talk about diversity, what we're talking about is who. That means the, the mix of different people within our organization, including things that we can see, for example, it could be around their racial profile, it could be the language that they speak, for example, um, but also the things that we might not see. So that includes things like differing abilities, for example, or personality, experiences, educational background. So diversity is about who is in your organization. Inclusion is about what people feel when they work with you, what they experience. Do they feel that their voice matters? Do they feel safe? 
Do they feel valued and as though their contributions are making a difference in the organization? So inclusion is really about how people experience your, your workplace. Whereas equity is about how your organization operates, how you make decisions, how people are treated. It's about whether or not individuals have equitable or fair access to opportunities, to being paid fairly, for example. So it's really important that we focus on the who, the what, and the how simultaneously. Because we know that focusing exclusively on diversity without a focus on inclusion and equity is unsustainable. We see underrepresented talent come into our organizations and without inclusion and equity, they do not thrive and they will not stay. And so there can be a revolving door of talent. And we know without a focus on equity, we are not in fact the fair organizations that we aspire to be. So again, we might bring in underrepresented and equity deserving talent. And if we're not prepared to pay them fairly, well then we are not living up to our promise as uh, an organization or as a community who is committed to equity and fairness. So we absolutely need to focus on all three. What's your take, Rashmi? Oh, thanks, Michelle. And uh, thanks, Mishka and GNCC and Niagara College for putting this on. And thanks to everybody for joining us. It's just really encouraging and exciting to see the interest in this topic. And I agree with, with what Michelle has been saying about recognizing the distinctions. And it is important. It is actually a really good question. We're striving for equality as an outcome. And if equality is an outcome, then equity, diversity, and inclusion are some of the steps to help us achieve that outcome. So I would say that equity um, is a process to achieve equality. And a good example recently would be what we've seen with childcare. So the federal government taking provisions to provide access to quality, affordable childcare is an example of equity with a view to try and establish equality in the workplace and equality in terms of opportunity uh, in employment and economic and social advantage. From a diversity perspective, I would also add that representation matters. So diversity is about the representation in your organization. And this is role models, or sometimes we refer to this as possibility models. And in some areas, sometimes diversity is thought of as cognitive diversity or intellectual diversity. Uh, Deloitte referred to this as diversity of thought. So the benefits that can be brought to the organization through that kind of thinking, different thinking, cognitive, intellectual diversity. And then from a leadership perspective, from a business perspective, from a manager's perspective, I would say that inclusion is the practice of actively engaging, creating the environment where inclusion and diversity is a belief that it becomes a leadership practice that you are actively including. Uh, and often this starts with listening and, and challenging some of our assumptions. And I'm sure we'll get into some of these how-to steps uh, as we go through the conversation. So I'm gonna pass it back to you, Mishka, thank you. Thank you so very much to both of you, actually to shedding a light really on the essence that is there. Michelle, I liked your way of looking at who, what, and how to create the outcome that we want. And Rashmi, in your way too, it's the process, the representation and the practice that actually make a difference with all of us being committed to the outcome that, they want, that we want to see, and that is that of equality. So thank you very much for setting that foundation because I think it is really good for us and for all of our attendees to saying like, this is the basis of which we actually look at it and move forward from here. Now, there have been a lot of conversations in the public, in the media, in different reports that have come out that speak to the benefits to an organization, to a business, to a committee in pursuing EDI initiatives as such. And I think that it's um, sometimes it still takes some persuasion of some individuals um, to saying like, you know what, is it, do we do it just because it's the right thing or are there other benefits that are linked to it? And Rashmi, I was wondering if you you can expand on that and then we'll maybe pass it on to Michelle after that. Yes, thanks Mishka. I think one of the benefits from a business perspective is really about inclusive uh, talent. Searching for talent is always a challenge. Our demographics are shifting. 
our population is aging and we are typically in a, in a situation where we've got talent and skill shortages. And so when we look beyond uh, and broaden our, our reach or broaden our thinking in terms of inclusivity and diversity, then we may have this cognitive thought diversity. We have this opportunity to have innovation and creativity. So I'll give you an example, SAP, which is a German software organization, I'm sure well known to many people. They started an autism at work program in 2013 because they recognized and valued neurodiversity. And they recognized the value of people who had autism as to what they could bring and what they could contribute. People with disabilities are often overlooked when we talked about EDI initiatives and, and as an employment population, they're significantly overlooked. So I mean, in the US, for example, the figures for people with a disability, they are twice as likely to be unemployed compared to the rest of the population. And from a business point of view, it's good for business. I don't know if you've noticed, but Gucci have uh, hired their first model, Ellie Goldstein, uh, with Down syndrome. So here's an opportunity for an organization to reach a broader audience. So in no economy can we afford to have any talent that is overlooked or underemployed. Women, for example, more than half the population. Um, the Toronto Region Immigration and Employment Council say uh, their statistics are from Stats Canada. New Canadians are 22% of our overall population and in Ontario, they're almost 30%. So there's a huge talent opportunity and skill set opportunity right there. And of the new Canadians, 76% speak more than one language and almost 40% have at least a bachelor's degree. So we're looking at skilled and valuable skilled talent that can bring creativity, innovation and advancement, competitive advancement and advantage to your organization. And I just wanna give a shout out to Niagara Focards who recently made a joint statement with the Toronto Immigration Employment Council regarding the recognition of international medical qualifications in the time of COVID. So this is a really interesting example of how this could not be more critical in terms of looking broadly and embracing uh, a wide range of talents and skill sets for all our businesses. Yeah, thank you so very much. And I think, Rashmi, it's a great link that you made between the skills challenge and the attraction of the skills that employers are looking for and the talent gap that often they're existing where we might not look actually outside of our normal given parameters, uh, actually, and in communicating and attracting the talent that we need. Michelle, um, your thoughts on it uh, as well? Agree with everything that Rashmi has, has shared with us today. And I would add that recent studies have shown that roughly 86% of job seekers prioritize a company's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion when making decisions about whether they want to work for that employer. And that's across demographic segments. It's not just underrepresented talent that want to know that your business cares about this. These include individuals who are from traditionally dominant groups. So white heterosexual men, for example, want to know that their organization cares about fairness and inclusivity and makes decisions based on merit. So it makes really good business sense that your organization focuses on this from a talent attraction standpoint. There's also been ample evidence over the years that organizations who prioritize inclusivity are, they tend to be much more uh, productive. I think they're the the performance gains are 22%, uh, turnover is 22% lower. Um, and we also see sales revenue increase with higher representation of racial and gender diversity within an organization. But what's really critical is most people think that the secret sauce is just bringing people together who are different. Just hire a number of different people and you put them in a room, the sparks fly, creativity and innovation happens. And what's, what's critical and what many of these studies have, have shown us is that in fact, it is a deliberate and intentional focus on inclusivity and equity that enables talent, that range of different people to get to those places of innovation, creativity, problem solving, higher performance, lower turnover, et cetera. So the business case, I think at this point is really, really clear um, that this is important. And I think what's different in the last couple of years is we're shifting from a place of how do we just strengthen representation to how do we ensure that, of course, we're strengthening representation and creating cultures where people can truly thrive and where we uh, 
where we bring out the best in all people so that we can be the best organization possible. Michelle, you're bringing up an excellent point, and that speaks actually towards the conscious effort that organizations and leaders have to make in creating the culture that we actually want to see. Can you expand on that uh, a little bit more and saying, looking at uh, uh, the attendees that we have today that have joined us today, all of who I'm so certain are committed to it, said, like, why does EDI demand a conscious effort? Um, and maybe to some degree, even how can they take the first steps moving forward on this? Would you like me to go first, Mishka? Yes, I'd love okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Wanting to be inclusive here and not jump in. Um, yes, so it does require conscious effort. Unfortunately, having a great intention is important and it's not enough to change systems, systems that have been in place for many, many, many years. Um, so it requires deliberate conscious effort for us to take action, to see and remove barriers that equity deserving people have faced over many, many decades. Um, one of the ways that we can do that, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, a bit later on, is to take stock right now of how diverse is your organization, how included do people feel, and how equitable do people perceive your organization to be? Where are there gaps in your current organization so that you understand what it is that you are solving for as a company? Where might there be different experiences, out different outcomes across different identity groups and different populations? It's that kind of conscious and targeted understanding or focused understanding that helps us to put in place the right actions to improve upon our culture, to improve upon our systems like recruitment, like talent management, for example. All of these things require an understanding of where we are today um, so that we can improve for the future. So knowledge is power. And I think for my best advice is the first step is asking yourself, where are we? Where are we doing really well today that we should continue to do these things? And where are there gaps that might be getting in our way? I really appreciate this. And, and this is actually interesting because I'm looking at our chat function too, and I'm looking also at some of the questions that have come forward and where people are really asking, and this is one of the questions from one of our participants here uh, as well, and it's Diana, and they're asking what steps would an organization take to begin developing a DNI program and policy statement? Again, how do we take stock of where we're at currently? Because it's more complex um, than what we likely think. And how do we move forward? Rashmi, what are some of your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, absolutely. And I think people need, everybody's looking for practical steps, which makes good sense. So I think the first thing to think about is what is your intention? So what is your motivation for pursuing an EDI strategy or an EDI agenda? So I think that's important too. Um, am I seeking talent? Am I seeking to expand my customer base, my supplier base? You know, what is, am I looking to attract talent? Um, Deloitte, for example, they have suggested in the research they've done that when an organization has an EDI policy or statement, they're automatically perceived as being more innovative. So there's a, there's a number of reasons that could be beneficial to an organization for pursuing that. So it'll be the first thing is, what is my motivation for doing this? And then as a leader or as a business owner, am I committed? I think that's another important key because leadership commitment is absolutely critical to sustain the work that needs to happen in order to make this effective. Um, at a very practical level, I would say that there's opportunities around just setting goals. So what is your first goal? So once you've got your intention, what are some of your goals? And this could be that we're gonna have a goal for the next quarter that I'm going to create a policy statement. And there's lots of great examples out there uh, that we can provide in the resources of how to get started on writing your EDI policy statement. Looking at hiring practices is always a great place to start. Um, can I broaden my supplier reach? Uh, do I just want to improve my networks and connections? So some of these sort of setting goals um, having the leadership commitment that EDI is a belief and that it's a value and then looking for areas of opportunity. So do I have any policies in my organization that might be um, contributing to perhaps unconscious bias? So for example, do I have a policy in my organization that says, um, if I'm going to work with a supplier, that supplier must have been doing business in Canada for five years. That could be a barrier 
to a new Canadian um, who perhaps has not been doing business in Canada for five years and asking yourself the question as to how critical that requirement actually is. There's a few things where unconscious bias can come into um, different areas of, of, a, of a business in terms of recruitment and, and, and selection, in terms of policy. Uh, for example, at one point in academia, you have to have continuous service to qualify for tenure. Well, that automatically excluded anybody who'd taken a mat leave. So uh, CN, just this week, they have actually now reversed their same-sex spousal survivor pension benefit. Um, it's taken them a long time, so, but it's never too late, right, to address your policies and to make those kind of changes. We saw some interesting uh, issues coming out of um, Georgia with the changes that Georgia, the state of Georgia and the U.S. have made to their voting regulations, and they were looking to disallow voting on a Sunday, which was disproportionately disadvantaging uh, large portions of the Black Christian population who have this concept of going from church to the polls, they call it soul to poll on a Sunday, and that's now been withdrawn due to pushback. So when I set goals, if I'm committed as a leader, then I look at my policies, practices, systems that may just have unconscious bias uh, buried into them. And then in a practical level, when we talk about inclusion as a practice, how do I run meetings? Is everybody's voice heard in a meeting? Am I actually listening? Am I, am I questioning whose point of view do we need to seek out? Whose voice is missing from this conversation? Whose ideas are listened to? Um, building relationships with the community is also a great opportunity. And I love this example from T-Mobile. T-Mobile in 2015, began a sponsorship agreement with the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. And they're now cited as one of the top employers for people with disabilities in the US. So these are just practices that we can do over time when we have that commitment and we, and we have that belief. Thank you so very much, Rashmi. And I really do actually appreciate your examples as well, because I think it makes us aware that when we talk about uh, the our commitment to it, to go beyond our own organization, like who are our suppliers, who are we working with, and, and look beyond of our own boardroom, our own committees, our own staff that we have, we do have to look at that as well. But uh, it's broader than that. And I think that's really good. And to also be clear on what motivates us, what is our commitment, and what is our overall goal as an organization too. And then I think it already opens up new avenues of thinking about uh, our commitment to it in different ways than what we had done in beforehand. What are the risks of not engaging in EDI practices at this time for businesses and the community? And I think this is an interesting uh, aspect that we need to look at um, in Canada-wide, internationally as well, but even in Naga as a community, we are a growing community. Um, you look at uh, our population forecast uh, that is set out for us, we are significantly, we are scheduled or planned to significantly grow in our population over the next 20 or 30 years. So if as a region, if as a community, as an organization, we are not engaged in those practices, what risks are we running into? And maybe Rashmi, if I start out with you and then we can pass it on to Michelle. Yes, thank you. And, and there are risks, absolutely. So I think at the macro level, we'll have economic growth problems. So I think if we have uh, sectors of our community, of our society who are not able to contribute their talent, their skills, their expertise, then we're going to have economic uh, growth challenges. So right now in terms of economic recovery, uh, the, the big researchers, the big box consulting firms, they're all anticipating second quarter 2022 as the time when we'll start to see some kind of significant economic recovery. But we're also seeing in parallel with that, uh, a fair bit of research that's happening at a global level, McKinsey are talking about this, World Economic Forum, World Bank, saying that we're going to require significant reskilling and upskilling by 2025. So we need to have this very heavy investment in our talent and in our people uh, moving forward in the very short term. At the local level, we're going to have talent shortages, we'll have missed opportunities, and we, we run the risk of a non-inclusive community. I was listening to a really interesting interview with uh, Francis Suarez, who is the mayor of Miami, and this was a, an economist interview just this week, and the, the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, is trying to develop Miami as a tech alternative to Silicon Valley, so he's trying to grow his city in that way. 
And one of his comments was uh, immigration is the path to prosperity. So when we include different communities, where we include diverse groups, it benefits everybody in terms of our prosperity. And just another comment on that would be access. When you are new to Canada or when you are not in a mainstream group, you don't have the same access. You don't have the same access to money, to investors, maybe even to advisors. All of those things can be a challenge, you know, strategic alliances, partnerships. So it can take a lot of time to create that kind of access. So for example, women over 50 are reported to be the most successful entrepreneurs and have the strongest performance. And yet investor money very rarely goes to those groups as we know. So we see these blocks uh, in terms of access. So in Niagara, for example, we have Niagara Workforce Planning Board uh, headed up by Viv Kinnaird and her team. And they actually have a mentoring program where you can partner as a business mentor with new Canadians. And I know they're always looking for volunteers. Um, and RBC, they started the Black Entrepreneur Startup Program. So there are great ways that we can um, ensure that people have access, that people can build those relationships, that people can have those links. And it actually benefits all of us, uh, socially and economically in our communities, locally and at the, at the national level. Thank you so very much, Rashmi. And I'm going to pass it on to you, uh, Michelle, as well. I can see you being eager to get into the conversation. Always. This is, it's so important that we have representation within our organizations because our customers are diverse, right? And so as the region of Niagara continues to grow and we see all kinds of different and new people who are coming in across age ranges and cultural backgrounds, for example, we, we will miss out on an opportunity to truly anticipate and design our products, our solutions to effectively resonate with those communities. If we don't have people internally who are helping us to see things from multiple angles. You know, one practical example is, you know, pay at the pump, something that many of us really benefit from. And I personally love as a mom of two small children, I don't have to get out of my you know, car and venture very far if the, my children are in my back, the back seat. I can literally just open the door and, you know, swipe or tap my card without having to leave them, you know, unsupervised for a prolonged period of time. It was a group of women who came up with that technology or that solution. And the reason why they were able to come up with that is they had lived experiences of having their kids in the car, having to venture into the gas station and feeling like, oh, what's going are they going to have a meltdown? What if they swallow something and choke while I'm in there? So it's having that perspective within your organization that helps you to empathize and understand what your end users or your clients might be going through, what journey they are taking, what pain points they might be experiencing, what's on their mind. So if you're hoping to grow as a business, if you're hoping to gain greater market share within our region, then absolutely you want to have people in your organization that can help you to empathize with, build for, and meet and deliver on the expectations of a diverse and um, multifaceted community. Thank you so very much. Um, and I appreciate both of you speaking to actually the importance on how to create that structure on your team and to some degree also to how to nurture diversity and inclusivity. If we start off with recruitment, it seems like a useful entry point when embracing it uh, in any organization. But other practices that companies can take beyond the recruitment offered um, that speaks to it because we have in Naga in Canada, across Canada, a high number, 97% of companies are small uh, organizations. So hiring and recruitment is, it does happen, but it doesn't happen regularly. So if I don't have an opening and I'm part of this call right now, how can, what kind of practices can I put in place uh, that would advance this particular topic? And Michelle, if I could ask maybe this of you. Absolutely. So on the inclusion side, one action that we can all take right away is to start a conversation about inclusivity with our colleagues. So that could include having a team discussion around what helps you to feel included? What does inclusion look like from your perspective? And what might be some of the barriers that get in the way of that? On an individual level, it's having a, a conversation with someone to say, what would enable me to be most inclusive of you. That could be, mean that a person requires time and space to pray 
over the course of their workday. Maybe they, you know, would benefit from a flexible schedule. Uh, maybe they're being interrupted all the time at work. And we know that this disproportionately happens to underrepresented talent. But having the conversation of what's your experience right now around inclusivity and what can we do to better include you to ensure that we're removing barriers is a great first place to start. And I think what's important about that is coming at it from a very open perspective. Um, we all must have humility around topics of equity, diversity, and inclusion. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. We don't know what it might feel like to be a person, you know, from a different demographic or a different lived experience in the workplace. And so to be open to the fact that someone might tell you something that you haven't seen before and you haven't experienced it before, and it might not be your truth, but it doesn't make it it doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't mean that it is an invalid, you know, experience. So two things can be true at the same time. It's not been your intention. It's not been your experience and it is someone else's reality. So having the conversation is a first and foremost, a great thing to do. The second piece on equity is to take stock of, take stock of who, and I love this word apparently, take stock, take a, take a, take stock of who has access to opportunity within your organization. Who's being mentored? Who have you mentored in the last six to 12 months? Who are you having career conversations with? Who has gone on training? Who, for example, has been promoted in the last several months or years? Where might there be differences in your organization? If you have access, if you're a person, for example, within a human resources function, what are the different performance ratings across demographic groups? For example, men versus women. Many of our organizations collect data on gender identity. Usually it's just male, female, unfortunately, but um, it's a piece of evidence, right? It's a, it's a data point that all of us can look at and say, are we noticing differences in performance ratings in promotions within our organizations? And if so, why might that be? Why might that be? What are the systemic reasons that may cause differences in how people advance within our organization. You know, for many years, we've been taught to look at individuals as the reason for, you know, lack of equity, lack of advancement representation in our organizations. So, you know, if, if millennials were just less entitled, if women were just more confident, you know, if racialized people were just more hardworking, we're now becoming much more enlightened to the fact that this is not an individual level problem. This is a systemic problem in how our organizations think about talent, how we make decisions about who to advance and who not to. So challenging ourselves to say, it's not about the people, it's about the processes, it's about the systems. And how can we ensure that there's no bias to what Rashmi had mentioned earlier that might be disproportionately disadvantaging uh, certain groups? Thank you so very much. And on that note, there's actually a couple of questions that have come in uh, via our chat to uh, that are looking at some practical tips on it. And one of the questions that has come in is, as inclusion is partially about making sure everyone is comfortable and feels safe at work or in group situations, and as unconscious biases and long running um, idioms and expressions can be somewhat ingrained, how does one deal with someone in a meeting stepping in it by saying something most of the time not on purpose that could make others in the meeting uncomfortable? How should the speaker address it and how should the chair of the meeting address it? And this is really looking at a more practical approach to it. Um, I, Rashmi, do you want to take it? Sure, and it's a great it's a great question. Thank you. I would say that offline and privately is usually the best way to tackle uh, those opportunities or those challenges if you can, and provide someone with alternate language. So if you if you are getting the sense that it is absolutely um, well intentioned but misplaced, and this is someone who um, has in no way intended to make a deliberately provocative statement or comment, then if you can privately offline, maybe even at the break, just perhaps provide them with some other language. Most of us would rather know if we were getting it wrong. So and would probably welcome that uh, in a positive way. If you don't have an opportunity to do that and it's happening in a meeting, then the best opportunity I would say is as the chair or as the facilitator is to model the right language yourself and to perhaps without humiliating or embarrassing anybody just then provide provide the right language for them to use in the right terminology 
I appreciate that. And it wasn't, uh, it, this question came in through our chat function, but there was a couple of people who also have emailed us a similar question. And just a question of us, how to deal with it. And even when we might observe it and hear it, but if it's directed at us, uh, and we might observe it as being a level of microaggression towards us and how to deal with it. So Rashmi, thank you very much uh, for that suggestion that is there. We have a lot of employers who are really speaking out and saying we're committed to it. Uh, it's maybe challenging for us to do it, but we're committed to um, the inclusivity, to diversity that is there. How do organizations, especially small businesses, measure and gather useful data uh, that is helping them actually really understand if they are making progress in it, how do they measure their effectiveness, and how can they move forward in, on that end of it? Rashmi, if you want to take that, and then I'll, I'll bring Michelle into the conversation. Yes, thank you. And it is a really good question because a lot of the, um, the frameworks are, are based for large corporations on how to gather data and how to create benchmarks. Um, Google, for example, they even put out an annual diversity report. So recognizing that is not realistic uh, for a small business. I think just start with your baseline. And if your baseline is zero, fair enough, good for you. This is where you are. And then measure any advancement that you can. Maybe it's an advancement of developing a policy. Maybe it's an advancement of just broadening your, your contacts, reaching out to different organizations. Maybe it's just looking at your hiring practices. Maybe you're only hiring three or four people per year and you don't have great turnover or a large staff, but could you at least start to look at some of those policies and then measure those as some of your successes? Um, other things that you can do, there, there's some guidance out there. For example, uh, in Canada, we actually put out a, uh, a list every year of Canada's best diversity employers, and that's readily available online. And you can take a look at some of those organizations, which include some nonprofits, public sector, City of Ottawa is on there, YMCA Toronto is on there, um, Vancouver Airport Authority, and just see what they're doing. Is there anything that they're doing that, that you could perhaps emulate? I think it really, the important thing is, you're willing and committed and that you just appreciate you're going to start measuring. And if your measurement is I'm going to reach out to two organizations in the next two quarters, good for you. That's what you're going to do. So just start with your intention, develop a couple of goals and then measure and track as you as you go on without feeling as if you have to make radical shifts in a short in short order. This is a, a longer term commitment anyway. So be kind to yourself and just um, give yourself time to embrace the, the concept and the process. Thank you. And uh, Michelle? We will share with you some resources on how you can measure both the diversity demographics of your workforce, but also inclusivity and equity within your workforce. And these are things that you can do quite, you know, quite readily, quite quickly to help you take you know, have a, a good understanding of where you currently are today. What's important to note, though, is when we are measuring diversity demographics, it's not because we're trying to check boxes. And I just want to relay this point. Um, what we're trying to do here is ensure that there are no barriers that prevent individuals and, and members of uh, disproportionately marginalized groups or uh, historically marginalized groups from accessing our organization, from entering into and advancing within our organization. And so the measurement piece helps us to figure out where might there be barriers. So, you know, if we see, for example, one of our clients has quite a strong uh, representation of racialized people. So uh, in other words, other words uh, that are often used to describe racialized people are visible minorities, people of color, for example. Um, they have a huge volume of, of individuals who are racialized in their organization, but when they measured by level, they saw that racialized people were predominantly in the lower levels of their organization, so entry level positions. And so the conversation becomes, why might that be so? Why might that be so? What are the barriers that exist? So we took the data and we ran focus groups and we held interviews to understand a bit more around you know, what's happening in recruitment, what's happening in advancement. And it's a multifaceted answer, but what one of the things that we learned, what it came down to is that there is a real lack of exposure of talent lower in the pipeline to senior decision makers who, when they're making decisions about, you know, their, their uh, succession pipeline, they're not aware of the incredible breadth of talent um, in the more kind of junior level. So they're not being developed, they're not being groomed, they're not being sponsored and they're not being mentored. So individuals are staying kind of stuck in the lower levels of the organization. So with that knowledge, we're putting in place sponsorship programs, mentorship programs. We're doing a lot more to facilitate 
uh, bonding and relationship building across the organization so that we can grow talent from within. And we're looking at how do we increase hiring, of course, of uh, individuals into more senior level positions as well. But that measurement piece is really critical because it tells you where you need to focus your energies. And to Rashmi's point, it helps you to put in place the right goals that will see you make meaningful progress over a period of time. And, and I'll just caveat that with, it takes time. So usually to see any sort of change, we're talking a two-year time frame with, with EDI um, to see sustained change. So it's important that we set clear goals, that we don't set too many goals. You know, usually I say between you know, three to five goals at the most over a two year period of time so that we can in fact see the progress that we are committed to seeing. Thank you so very much. And um, I just wanted to also mention to uh, all of our participants here today, uh, there's a high number of resources that actually both Rashmi and Michelle actually have uh, provided us with. And uh, we will share them um, right afterwards. We will email all of those sites and resources to you uh, in addition to actually this webinar as well. So you will get them within the next 24 hours too, because I think it's critical at the same time. Michelle, there's a question that has come actually to us via email. Should committees have a person or organization have one individual committed to this topic that is actually taking the lead on it? I know we want to see it within the within all of us, um, but it takes some commitment uh, to it as well. Is it suggestive when we look at small businesses, if you look at sm small committees, if you look at boards, to have a certain person um, appointed to that, keeping everyone focused on this topic? What are your thoughts on that? It's very helpful to have formal accountability within an organization. Absolutely. And oftentimes we have intentions to make this a priority, but business as usual, you know, happens and people, you know, tend to kind of fall back to doing, you know, their full time job. And even though they have great intentions, this falls off the radar. Um, what I would also say, though, is that it's really important that we create that we co-create our equity, diversity and inclusion strategies with our people. So. I would never advise one person to develop this their strategy or their action plan in isolation because they will be centering their own experiences and centering their own perspectives. And particularly if you're a member of a dominant group, a privileged group such as myself as a white woman, it's really important that I decenter myself and I listen to with humility. I listen to the voices and experiences of those around me so that we can ensure that we're doing the right thing for the organization and in particular advance uh, individuals who are from historically marginalized groups. Um, the other piece I would say is there's a great article which we will send you called Why Diversity Programs Fail from Harvard Business Review. And what they have indicated is that there's somewhere between, it was like a nine to 60% uh, benefit or increase in the effectiveness of EDI strategies when there is a cross-functional group of people in an organization who are helping to drive it. So the most effective way to do that is a task force. If you have a small company, you might not have a lot of employees who can sit on a task force, but you might have volunteers, you might have customers, you might have board members. That's great. Bring a range of different people together to help you define what your priorities are, establish your vision, as Rashmi has mentioned, and drive this, this focus forward. Don't go alone is what I'm essentially trying to say is surround yourself with uh, diverse voices, with other individuals who can help you to advance this important priority. Perfect. Thank you so very much. Uh, I think it's an excellent, excellent point uh, to that. We have a couple of questions uh, that have come forward. And so I'm trying to uh, get to some of them. And this is one, um, and it indicates one of the challenges we face in Naga is that the community itself is relatively monocultural compared to more cosmopolitan areas like Toronto. How can organizations promote diversity in what is on the outset um, looks like a rather undiverse area. And Rashmi, if you want to speak to that, um, in some ways we've kind of answered it too uh, throughout uh, the past 45 minutes of what really diversity is, but uh, I, I still think it's a very good question. It, it is a good question, absolutely. And I think uh, taking the stats that we mentioned earlier, 30% uh, of the Ontario population are new Canadians. So we have this sort of opportunity within this province 
Um, and certainly when we look at what's been happening through the pandemic, remote working has become obviously the norm in so many situations for knowledge workers uh, and different kinds of employment. So we can recruit from much further afield than perhaps we have in the past. So there's that opportunity. And then we have organizations inside Niagara. We have the Niagara Folk Arts, we have Niagara Workforce Planning Board, we have the Friendship Center. We have uh, in the province, we have Black North initiatives. So these are organizations that one can connect with if we're looking for um, new Canadians or vis visible minority support. And then also not uh, forgetting that we have, sometimes women are also an important part of the EDI conversation, even though they are 50% of the population. So there's a huge opportunity there from a gender equity perspective. And then, as I mentioned earlier about disability. So thinking about EDI in the broader sense too, there are all kinds of opportunities um, within the region. And, and I just wanted to add, if I may, about the measurement piece that what we're seeing in some organizations around measurement is, is the triple bottom line in terms of valuing your triple bottom line. So not just your financial measures. So I think it's one thing to appoint a, a manager of EDI, which is a really good move forward. And there's currently about 345 postings on LinkedIn for managers or directors of EDI. But it's really about what's measured and what's valued by the organization. So Moody's, for example, the credit rating organization, they are starting in Europe to include diversity as a, as a measure of your qualifications for credit rating as an organization. And I think when we start to see some of these advancements, and maybe we'll see this in nonprofit, maybe we'll see it in municipalities, I don't know, that will have funding tied to diversity initiatives, social impact initiatives, environmental impact initiatives, as well as financial outcomes. And I think when we can start to see movements in those areas, we'll see some very interesting opportunities and changes. Yeah, makes sense, actually. Um, and I, I really do appreciate that perspective on it, too. How can we measure systemic barriers in the workplace? And this is a question that has come up a couple of times uh, over this uh, last uh, couple of weeks of promoting uh, today's webinar. What sort of data clues exist to indicate that we as an organization might have an inclusivity problem uh, that exists? I don't know, Michelle, maybe if you want to uh, tackle this one, how do I really identify? How do I know that I have or that we have a problem in that area? So again, the measurement piece is so important. First of all, understanding the demographics of your workforce and having that collected within your human resources information system is critical because what it allows you to do is you can do equity analyses. So. For example, we partner with organizations to see what differences are happening in recruitment rates, in promotion rates, in development rates, in turnover, in grievances, in investigations, in absences. And those numbers tell a story. So if we see that there's you know, a particular, let's say um, people without disabilities are indicating that, that they uh, or we're seeing that they're much more likely to get promoted, then we know that there is a systemic issue there where people with disabilities are not uh, accessing the same opportunity for advancement in the organization. And it's from that those numbers that we can then figure out why might that be so. And we can also measure our progress. So over time, by improving advancement practices, debiasing them, and we're going to give you some tools and resources to start to debias some of these practices, we should see the promotion rates for people with disabilities come more in line with people the, the promotion rates for people without disabilities. And I think there's an excellent point is actually that the measurements that actually do exist, uh, we might not want to look at them, you know, because it's maybe difficult to look at them because it's like looking in the mirror and, and really being honest and truthful of what is what we really are being faced with. Um, what would you say is the most difficult part of implementing a diversity and inclusion program and how do you overcome it? So we are speaking to it. Um, we have the tools. What, what makes it the hardest to overcome, the hardest to implement? Michelle? Fear. Fear? So yes, simply put, I think um, what I'm encountering is very good intention. People want to lean into this more, they want to learn, and they're terrified of saying and doing the wrong thing. They don't want to offend and they do not want to be canceled. And so I think what's really important in this is that we all have the humility to recognize that we will make mistakes. 
and that it's impossible to be an expert on all aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion. As, and as one of our uh, attendees has mentioned in the chat, we will all step in it from time to time. But what's important is that we learn and we progress. So we cannot measure our impact or our progress on EDI by how perfect are we at all. What it's about is how willing am I to challenge myself to be uncomfortable, to make mistakes and keep going anyway. A really great book for those of you who like to learn through reading is Think Again by Adam Grant. And it's all about how we must challenge our assumptions and embrace a greater and more humble way of being in our organizations, recognizing that no one of us have all of the answers. So it's that kind of humility that I think is critical to encourage. Humility and courage are the two most important um, capabilities or qualities when advancing EDI. Thank you so very much. There's a question uh, by Ruth. And what do either of uh, you uh, think about uh, gender balanced analysis uh, that is being done or conducted uh, through the federal government uh, as a place to start out? And Rashmi, if you, uh, as a founder of the Gender Equity Task Force, might want to stem. <laughs> Yes, thank you. And thank you, Ruth, for the question. I think anything, so these are analysis and, and tools that have been made available to employers, to individuals. Uh, there's a lot of great work going on at Rotman at University of Toronto through their uh, gender and the economy division. Um, they're doing a lot of great work and they've put out the G, uh, GB plus analysis. And I think any of these tools are helpful if they help start a conversation. So if it's just giving you some insight, giving you some tools and causing an opportunity for pause and reflection. Uh, so the only, the only risk that we have for any of us is to do nothing. So if we do something and we, we make some steps and it gives us a chance to have a conversation with our teams, have a conversation, even self-reflection, then I think there's great benefit uh, in any of these tools that are available to us, absolutely. Excellent. Um, here's uh, another practical question that has come forward. Uh, where are the best places to look for diverse candidates for job postings? It's a very straightforward question and uh, I'm not sure if uh, you have the answers, but Michelle, um, any suggestions or Rashmi on this topic? Well, I would say LinkedIn is always a great place because it's incredibly uh, robust uh, as a tool. So I think LinkedIn is a really good source. And then closer to home, I would say, look to build relationships with different organizations and different communities. So go to Niagara Workforce Planning Board, go to Niagara Folk Arts, uh, get involved with the EDI committees. Uh, we've been very well supported at the council levels, uh, city-wide, the city of St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, uh, the uh, municipality, the region have started to put together EDI committees and have that kind of representation. So there's good advice and good guidance and good places to start. So I think it's about broadening one's exposure but I would say at the very least, uh, LinkedIn and some of our local organizations would be really helpful. That's excellent. Um, on that note, I'm conscious of the time and we only have about uh, three minutes to go and I always give uh, each panelist a chance to make some closing comments uh, at the end of maybe each one of you for a minute. Uh, Rashmi, I think you started out with the first question if I'm right. So Michelle, maybe if I'm... Um, could ask you to start out with maybe a minute of closing comments uh, on this topic and then I'll pass it back to Rashmi. Thanks, Mishka. It, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel very overwhelming on your journey to improving equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I and I just want to honor that and say it can, it can, it's a lot, right? And please don't let that feeling of overwhelm keep you in a place of stagnation. There are some very practical things that anyone, regardless of what company you work in or you know what community you live in, can do today to start to advance this. I think number one is just have conversations. What does inclusion mean to you? You know, when do you feel most included? What can I do to better include you on our team or to promote greater equity? I think we can all start to just notice how we show up in the world. Who do you listen to? Who are you mentoring? Who are you advocating for, opening doors for, and who aren't you? And challenge yourself to do better. You know, I think that there's a real element here of embracing a growth mindset. We're all on a journey. We're all improving. And it takes time and it takes effort, but you can absolutely start today. Start reading articles. Start attending different events like this. Start changing who you're listening to and, and ensuring that you have a range of different people um, who are helping to inform the way that you think. 
So I think these are things that anyone can do. And I just encourage you to continue on your journey. Don't let the fear of being canceled stop you from engaging and continuing to learn and grow in this space. Thank you so very much, Michelle. And Rashmi? Yeah, that's great, Michelle. And thank you. I would say such a great turnout for this session today and such great commitment, excellent questions. And this is the coalition of the willing is how I've heard this described, that you've got like-minded people who are looking to make advancements. So I think, you know, create those connections. Maybe after this session, go and have a conversation about this session to someone who wasn't here. So at least start and have some of that discussion. I think from a leader's perspective, I'm a firm believer in distributed leadership. You don't have to have all the answers. You need to show the direction and the commitment, but talk to your team, talk to other organizations, talk to colleagues and help create the, the solutions and, and the possibility and believe in the possibility of how we can truly, I think we have an incredible opportunity in our lifetime now to make significant impact and change. And I feel like we have such a great time to really seize this and make some significant impact uh, for our generations and those behind us. Yeah, I can only second that. I am just on the uh, on both of your messages and basically like to dive more into it, to read up on it, to start those conversations. <clears throat> I want to make everyone here aware too is that Innovate Niagara is hosting uh, an equity, diversity, and inclusion workshop called the Business Case for uh, EDI on May the 20th. Uh, they're doing it in partnership with our uh, Women in Naga, or WIN Council. And again, it's on May the 20th uh, from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, both uh, Rashmi and Michelle, so wonderful to have had this conversation. And I think it's a conversation that we could have had um, probably for another hour and longer with uh, more follow-up questions to it. Many of you have asked regarding resources um, and uh, that are going to be made available, links to different sites, books that have been mentioned. All of that will come to you via a follow-up email. Today's uh, webinar has also been recorded and will be available on our website at gncc.ca and it will be also emailed uh, to all the participants today. So to, uh, for you who've been able to attend and given us this hour, thank you so very much uh, for joining us. My thanks also go to Niagara College uh, for making this possible and Rashmi and Michelle, um, thank you for being with us and your direct contact information in case organizations are interested in reaching out to you directly will be shared as well. So thank you for that and uh, I'm wishing everyone a good rest of the day. So thank you. Bye-bye.